Hey, pals, we just want to say thank you to all our fans that support us out there. If you want to become a supporter and you like to support us through the value for value proposition, we provide value and we would love to see you give us some value back. You can see all the ways that you can do that at Patreon. You can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash go with the heat. Now let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season five, episode four, titled Bad Timing. Yeah. <laughs> Bad song. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's the timing. <laughs> I think the Bad name- timing for this episode. <laughs> we, we were going so strong, too. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like, were, this is just bad timing all around. <laughs> <laughs> it originally premiered- This episode accomplished nothing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I have, I have an opinion about that. Well, I'm going to say for, for, for my final thoughts, but I think the bad story is an exchange of a theme that they're trying to deliver. But we're going to come back to that. This episode, okay. this episode originally premiered on December 2nd, 1988. It is written by Scott Shepard, who also helped write Redemption and Blood and Freefall. He's like a teleplay writer on both of those. He's got two more episodes coming that he wrote himself, all by his big oh, boy self. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is directed by Virgil Vogel. That name should sound familiar. He's directed a number of episodes, including Cuba Libre, Teresa, Hell Hath No Fury, and then this is his last one. Well, there you go. <laughs> Close the book on you. <laughs> you know, and I'll talk more about this in guest stars, but I think they were having some kind of vice reunion while they were filming this episode. <laughs> um, because there's a lot of returning people in this. Virgil Vogel went out with a bang. All my friends are in this one. <laughs> Served ice cream cake. Before we get started, could check in and see what's going on each other's lives. Pals? All of us have multiple skills, and, you know, we learn new skills all the time. John, unfortunately, has found himself learning a skill he never wanted to learn. (laughs) Yeah, I have somehow become a real estate agent unknowingly. (laughs) So first I had to help mom sell her house, and then I helped her buy a new house. And, And now my little sister is trying to sell her house and buy a house up where I live. So I have board houses for her with her. And I was just informed that her in-laws are also thinking of following (laughs) suit. And so now I'm giving them suggestions on where they should look based on what they're looking for. And so I'm an expert on this real estate market, man. (laughs) Um, Are you looking for a two bedroom downtown? I can get you in for cheap. I know people. (laughs) Number one on the West side. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I knew something like you were spending more time than you wanted to involved in it because I saw a passing in a text message and a group message that was talking about what HOAs were like. And you dropped some barnyard knowledge in everyone where it was like, well, pre-1979 in in this part of the county. It was like Cliff Clavin knowledge. (laughs) (laughs) The bylaws state, according to code 719. I think he's secretly training to be a real estate agent. Are you studying the books, Sean? Is that what's going on? That's why you knew all that. (laughs) Trying trying to get my license, but it's competitive for old Gil. (laughs) Well, speaking of soaking up some new properties, Sonny's got his eyes on something out in the glades. And, you know, I, I think there's lots of opportunity out there, depending on which town you go to and how many vacant houses there have been in the recent history. <laughs> Let's go talk about this week's episode. All right. So we open up and we're at an IAD hearing and some truth bombs are about to be dropped. <laughs> Ouch. It's very painful for Crockett. <laughs> yes. Someone yes. from IAD. Th- this guy immediately testifies on how much Crockett sucks. I mean, just look at him in that white suit. He says Sonny is erratic, insubordinate, and his memory loss scheme is a scam. Also, water wet, sky is blue. Uh, Yeah, I mean, what he was saying was not (laughs) untrue. Except for maybe the memory loss thing, but... He is erratic. (laughs) He did with dangerous. He is insubordinate. Uh (laughs) And we will further prove that he is also a murderer twice, multiple times. I'm sorry, he tried to kill Tubbs twice. Uh, Let that be on the record. Dude, and his only defense is like, amnesia did it. I didn't do nothing. Amnesia did it. He even gets a doctor... Uh, the, on the stand, saying like he bonked his head pretty good. I mean, I'm no dermatologist. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's like, I think you Amnesia you might have done it. <laughs> exactly. My favorite is Tubbs' testimony. <laughs> when they ask him, he's like, he's my best friend. I love him. And they say, well, what, what about him trying to kill you? <laughs> what about that uh, officer that Sonny killed? And Tubbs is like, yeah, that guy kind of deserved it. So he's like, hey, he <laughs> was crooked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was crooked. He was self defense. Yes. <laughs> And then they're like, well, he tried to kill you. He's like, yeah, that, that happened. But he did save my life, though. But he did try and kill him twice. I just want to point that out. It wasn't yeah, once, once. It was two twice. separate occasions. And then the neurosurgeon at the end where they ask him, like, hey, is it possible? And he's like, you're right, Johnny. He says, so you did bunk his head pretty hard. He's like, but I'm not a psychologist. And I don't know shit about the brain. So. <laughs> yeah. He's like, yeah. you should say it to a psychologist. You want to know about that. Yeah. <laughs> No, 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 no. We dermatologists is way to go. <laughs> I know we're having a lot of fun here at the beginning about how they're <laughs> grilling Sunny. The reality is at the end of this where it does get a little serious is that when it breaks, the IAD board says he needs to go on vacation. He's on furlough and he also needs to talk to a psychologist. Pending further investigation. Wouldn't call that serious. Listen to how harsh this is. You're full you're on full suspension, no jail time. Come back on your own reconnaissance, <laughs> murderer. <laughs> Where I get the serious is that at the end, you see Sonny, he's turning over what he heard, what everyone was saying about him. And obviously he heard, you know, his friends defend him, not the ladies, they weren't invited, but <laughs> his friends. <laughs> well, Stan wasn't invited either, for the record. <laughs> he did hear them defending him, but he also heard what people outside of his department think of him. And it's not yeah. just the IAD, but just like everyone around what they think of him. And he has to cope with now the things that he's done. And you start to see cracks in him. Like, I don't think I can do this anymore. Not just am I burning out, but I'm also, I'm a murderer. So a, maybe yeah. I deserve all this. I think part of the reason why he took it so hard is because he started realizing that his behavior was that way before he even had the amnesia. So like people or people perceived him that way before the amnesia even happened from outside. He's erratic. He does whatever he wants. He's like a cowboy. He's a rebel. And he didn't think people, he didn't know people saw him that way. And now he's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, uh, is he just that it just that ignorant how he behaves i mean okay all right well at least he's got like dad and tubs there like you know they're, they're telling him like hey feel better buddy like it's okay <laughs> at the end of the day he's still rich right <laughs> true <laughs> i don't think he i think the, like, he never there's never any discussion about that money so no he's not rich in fact there is discussion later on in the episodes where he's poor so he never got any money from caitlin's what i'm saying <laughs> Damn, the prenup that we didn't plan on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then we go to the opening credit. Now, this is our moment to check in with the guest stars. Let's say that the guest star acting isn't stellar. So, John, I'm not holding my breath on who <laughs> these people are. All right. So, uh, at first, I want to give an honorable mention, as I said in the open, that there were some returning cast members, but not in the guest stars, but in the co-star credits. They had 11 co-star credits in this episode, with the most famous being Mark McCauley, who we've seen before. Uh, you might remember Mark McCauley as Suko in the episode Bashudo, mm. Pit Driver in the episode Streetwise, <laughs> Brookings in the episode Death and the Lady, and he will come back to play Johnny <laughs> Cottonman in the world of trouble. Plus, he gets to be an air traffic controller in Miami Vice the movie. <laughs> Damn. He must live there or something. And like Mookie, the other 10 co-star credits all appeared in at least one other episode of Vice as a different character. Damn. To the guest stars, actually all original first timers. Let's start with Melissa Leo, who plays Kathleen Gilchrist, I believe is our partner. Yes. She was a regular on All My Children and The Young Riders. Her breakout role was in 1993 when she played Detective Sergeant A. Howard on Homicide Life in the Street for the first five seasons. And she would actually reprise the role for the TV movie Homicide, the movie. Damn. Did you know they made a life, Homicide Life on the Street TV movie? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I didn't either. I think it was called The Wire. <laughs> uh, she was nominated for an Academy Award for her performance in the film Frozen River. She actually won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress in the movie The Fighter in 2010. Damn. I think you got Melissa all worked up when you said Young Writers. I love that show. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> that had Josh Brolin in it. That's how Josh Brolin was his first role. 
was in that besides Goonies. I was like, mm, mm, I, I need to find that. Skimmed over. <laughs> <laughs> she also nursed Pam in the Fox's event series, Wayward Pines. And in 2017, starred in the next fl- the Netflix film, The Most Hated Women in America, as American Atheist founder Madeline Murray O'Hare. Some of her other movies are 21 Grams, Olympus Has Fallen, and The Equalizer, and the soon-to-be-released Equalizer 2, which, funny story, she also guest appeared in a 1985 episode of The Equalizer in which the films are based on. You know what's weird here is that she's like, one of the most accomplished guest stars that we've had on Vice. And she just totally flew under the radar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, you don't even see her coming. And, like, if you look at, like, all of her credits, man, she has been in a ton of stuff. And she is still in a ton of stuff. Our next guest star is William O'Leary, who plays Scotty McKenna. He played Marty Taylor, Tim Taylor's younger brother in TV show Home Improvement. Oh. <laughs> he was the guy on the riding mower at the beginning. Mm. Yeah, and that's kind of one of the bigger roles. Now, he also played Jimmy in Bull Durham, so oh, we can't yeah, forget right. about that. Yeah, I remember him now. <laughs> uh, he was in 22... He was in 22 episodes of the show Dear John, and he was in Candyman, Farewell Farewell to Flesh, which is just a classic. <laughs> it sounds like a porn. He was, al- <laughs> <laughs> he was also in the TV movie Project Alf. I'm listening. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> His most recent role is he played the an- antagonist, General Xavier. I-, I am probably saying that wrong. On Cayman Rider Dragon Knight, which uh, <laughs> okay. was on CW for Kids Block in 2008-2009, but was uh, canceled. So <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> but they'll always have the Alf days. <laughs> Our next guest star is Pruitt Taylor Vince. He plays Cruz, and he actually he has a condition called the stagmus, which is a, the involuntary movement of the eye. And that's actually kind of what he's known for in his movies. And you see it in the episode. Yeah. At one point, he looks up and his eye kind of does that. Like was, He's kind of known for that. I was wondering how the hell he could do that, but it turns out it's just <laughs> kind of disease. <laughs> yes. Whoops. His film debut was in the movie Down by Law, except his scenes were edited out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's just gotta be it's just a crappy feeling as an actor. Like, oh man, I'm gonna be in this big movie. You, you get it, and your scenes are all cut out because they don't tell you. They don't tell you like, hey, we're just cutting you completely out. He also played the dim-witted KKK member in Mississippi Burning. I was gonna make a comment, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> no <Okay>. surprises. <laughs> Lee Bowers in JFK. First lead film role was in the independent film Heavy with Liv Tyler. Our next guest star is Farmer, who plays Wilson. Is an actor and musician born in, and, and God forgive me, they are making it difficult on me and guest stars this week. Born in Oswekin, Ontario, into the Cayuga Nation and Wolf <laughs> Clan of the High Paden Sani Iroquois Confederacy. Sounds good to me. Which is a uh, uh, group of Native American tribes in New York. So his first major role was on the CBC channel Spirit Bay. Also played as Captain Joe Stone Street on Forever Night. And then Chief Tom on the TV series The Res. I mean, you guys have heard of all these shows, right? <laughs> yeah. But you guys you guys watch Canadian television too, right? <laughs> you watch the, the CC. Doesn't everybody? Yeah, that's right. Most uh, most of his roles are Canadian TV shows, but there is a theme here. We've got Chief Tom. We've got Captain Joe Stone Tree, the Native American spirit guide Nobody in the movie Dead Men. <laughs> huh. I wonder. I wonder what kind of characters they have him play. I mean, they wouldn't. They wouldn't pigeonhole him know. into a specific role, would they? I don't know. I don't know. I, I joke, but he doesn't always play a Native American. He played Bert in uh, the 2001 thriller The Score. He was also in a few episodes of the kids' show Big Comfy Couch. And to our last guest star, Stephanie Roth. Hab- Haberly. She plays Dr. Samantha Phillips, though she wasn't asked to act much, just kind of sit there and stare blankly. <laughs> this was actually her acting debut, which is probably why they didn't give her many speaking, speaking <laughs> lines. Um. 
When we come back from the opening credits, we're at prison, and it's our prison band. <laughs> yeah, give it up. All right. Yeah. This, this must be where all the money goes. They got a pretty sweet setup. This is exactly why the prisoners only get honey buns and ramen to eat. They got to pay for all this equipment for this band. Jermaine Stewart's getting, man. I bet the prisoners love this. You know, things are just going to get so messy in the shower tonight. <laughs> A guy in chaps? What don't they love about that? Come on. <laughs> Thank God after a few minutes, the prisoners revolt. We don't have to listen to the music <laughs> it's anymore. It's really bad. <laughs> it's really bad, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yeah. They, I would riot, too. I mean, they were promised little Richard. I just saying I support this action. Like this is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they attack the band, and the guards come racing, and the band escapes out the fence. And then apparently none of them actually escape in that in that riot because when we go to the next scene a truck pulls up and a man gets out who looks like a roadie for the band he opens up the truck and opens up two cases that have two that have prisoners inside of them that are escaping so no that first scene didn't because, actually matter no i think they were creating a diversion so they could get into the equipment boxes because of course the prison is not going to check two human sized uh <laughs> boxes of luggage i mean it is a florida prison <laughs> Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> Very true. Very true. And uh, of course, they are immediately betrayed, and now they have to find a new drummer or Jermaine <laughs> Stewart. The driver gives the guys a bag with some clothes in it and a couple of guns, and the first thing, of course, they do is they shoot and kill the driver. So I have a question throughout this whole episode, which is these guys don't do a very good job of trying to escape prison. They go on quite the murderous rampage. It makes it easy to track them as they travel across the state of Florida. I'm, I just got out of prison. I'm not going to hide, though. I'm going to shoot everybody I find. <laughs> I know. They, and they, they suck at this whole criminal stuff. I think total dollar amount they made throughout the entire episode was like $45. <laughs> and they had to burn someone for that. This episode might be okay if it wasn't for these guys. These actors like the lines that were written for them. And I'm going to give you an example. At the end of the scene, a, a Cruz bends down and grabs the sunglasses off the dead driver and says, rock and roll. And then they go to commercial. <laughs> But he hates rock and roll. <laughs> Over at the psych office, Sonny's having his first meeting. And of course, the first thing he does and says, hey, it must be nice sitting around on an air conditioned room just asking people questions all day. You got it pretty easy here, toots. <laughs> Over at another house, a Florida couple is having their lives in middle age hell. One man is riding on a lawnmower who has died inside years ago. She's going on and on about music and crystals and has her martini in her hand while she's out doing the gardening actually i'd be kind of dead inside too if i was married to her <laughs> miriam oh yeah oh, miriam yeah he, he's trying to ignore he's like he, he's just you know he's thinking in his head like just shut up and let me mow i get 15 minutes to mow a week this is my time <laughs> Yeah, that all that time he has for not having a job and for supporting him <laughs> sounds like a really bad deal. Granted, yeah, we don't know that yet. We find out later that he's got a pretty sweet gig going. Car pulls up, it's Cruz and Wilson, and Scotty, that's the man's name, he suddenly springs to life and is happy to see his buddies, even though they're totally ignoring him. Like, try to shake their hand, they ignore him, they go right into the house. Wife's like, hey, what's going on? And he just looks at her and like, see you later, and closes the door. They're, they're here about the pizza list, Dad. You know, it's clearly <laughs> prostitution. <laughs> Back at Sonny's meeting with the psychologist, he's busy mansplaining to the police officer psychologist what a police officer does. <laughs> see, I go undercover, and what I do is I pretend I'm someone else. He's like literally telling her that. He's like, I have to pretend. When you're undercover, you have to pretend you're someone else. And sometimes you forget who you really are. <laughs> now, this is one of the moments where I'm talking about that the Cruz Wilson escape from prison storyline was just because they had the vice to sing up. What they really wanted was an episode for Sonny to talk about his feelings, but they couldn't have an episode of vice yeah. like that because he then goes on to talk about that. He feels distant. He feels alone and isolated that he deals with sleazoids all the time, but that might be where he belongs because when he is with the sleazoids, he feels the most comfortable. Because he's a sleazoid. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody hold me. <laughs> this is really introspective of Sonny and a sign of like what he's going to be going through for the rest of the season. There's going to be always these doubts in his head of will it ever come back? It was that really me. When I had amnesia, was that the real version of me coming out in that? And that's what I'm saying about this episode is that they couldn't have a whole episode of him just talking to a psychologist. They so they had, had to add some action. <laughs> so now we're going to go to what is probably my favorite scene of the whole episode. 
It's Cruz, Wilson, and Scotty all cruising in Scotty's convertible car. Or sorry, it's the car that Cruz and Wilson pull up in. And apparently the stereo doesn't work because he's gonna use Scotty's gonna use a boombox from the back seat and he's gonna put on some great Tim Turner classic <laughs> rock music. <laughs> uh-huh. And Wilson and Cruz is having nothing of that. He says, No rock music ever then slaps him in the back of the head. <laughs> Dude, that's what he starts telling him about that sweet gig he had. So they had a pool. They had cable. 15 whole dollars. <laughs> <laughs> that's how much he gets for being there. <laughs> yeah, Miriam is the one that has all the credit cards, has all the money. She's the one that's been supporting him this entire time. Let their man on the outs be more prepared for their and then have $15 in a pink boombox. His name is Scotty. Do we need to go over that again? <laughs> Master <laughs> criminals don't have a name, Scotty. <laughs> and I have a sneaking suspicion they're going to be investing that $15 into a sandwich pretty soon. <laughs> Back at the psych office, Sonny is saying his friends have always been there for him, especially Rico. He loves Rico. He's afraid that he's going to hurt his friends. He just goes on this long, winded, winding road about how (laughs) Sonny is burning out. Yeah, that's that's the gist of it. (laughs) So, of course, you know, we all know Sonny. And when he's stressed out, he's got a lot going on in his head. The first thing he does is jump on his hog and go (laughs) riding. Yeah, what the did, did you rent that? Did he go out and rent a motorcycle? <laughs> I told Dominic, I was like, Dominic says, I bet you you never see this motorcycle again. I'm like, no, you don't, because I think you rented it. <laughs> of all the motorcycle suits, he's got on like a gray Armani suit. <laughs> no, while he's I, know. I think he's just riding on the train to anywhere here. He, yeah, there's no destination. I think he's just going somewhere. We're gonna find out shortly that he was looking for an old honky tonk. Like the ones his dad used to take him to. <laughs> you know, his dad, a responsible alcoholic pool shark. <laughs> he took his son to the pool hall with him. At a gas station, Cruz and Wilson want some free gas, so they threaten someone behind bulletproof glass. That sounds about right for our criminals in this episode, that that's the way they would operate. Mm-hmm. The, atten- the attendant is really smug. And when they don't get their money and their free gas, they decide to pour gas all over the booth. Now, hold on. One, the door wasn't made of bulletproof <laughs> glass. <laughs> so they could have got, she's got to get in there somehow. Yeah. Two, when she goes to leave, the door is clearly unlocked because she just pushes it open. Yeah. <laughs> so I have questions why she stayed there while they poured, while they poured the gasoline on it. She was like, oh, no, don't do that. Just get the hell out of it. Well, and run. Not, <laughs> not just that. Not just that, but she gave them the money, which was her only leverage, because uh, up until then, they were going to have to burn it down with the money in it. And then they accomplished nothing. <laughs> also, everyone at the gas station is just watching. Oh, man, look at that. It's getting mm-hmm. bored over there. <laughs> at the very end of that scene, they go taken off in a van. What the hell happened to the convertible? I know. <laughs> I think that van was the van that belonged to the guy who was getting gas in the gas can. Why'd they take it? I don't know. <laughs> So they just, yeah, they just downgraded for no reason. I so like they they lost on this uh, on this this whole crime thing's harder than it looks. <laughs> also, they only got like ten dollars. You can see when she like hands him the money, it's like, well, that was great. You got like ten bucks. <laughs> Out in the glade, Sonny's still cruising on his motorcycle. He gets stopped for some construction like right before an intersection, <laughs> and there's this guy fishing <laughs> off the bridge, and Sonny is having flashbacks to him killing people and it made me think of rick and morty with the alien was like here i go killing again so we're getting this motorcycle montage and then it ends with him talking to this uh, guy who's fishing it, it, like i don't know sonny's brain hurts or something like he's having a <laughs> he, he can't remember his favorite fishing spot so he like it's all flustered just takes off very unsafe on those construction sites you gotta wait for the flagger to wave you through <laughs> John's got a little experience in that. I don't know. I thought that old yes. man was kind of nosy. Like, <laughs> I didn't want to talk to you. I'm having a flashback over here about when I tried to murder my friend. <laughs> and that when that boat exploded, because you said something about fishing. Yeah, he's like, suddenly now I'm remembering everything. Oh, my God. I was a great uh, fisherman. <laughs> at an open house, a real estate agent, John, is having the sale of her mm-hmm. life. She's got a couple that's newly pregnant. She's telling them how great the house is because they can see stars in the sky. <laughs> During the day, by the way. <laughs> She's, She's show killing up. it. It's killing it, man. A knock at the door, and it's Cruz and Wilson. They're looking for someone named Doc Jerry. 
They threaten the agent who finally remembers, like, oh, yeah, there's this guy, Doc. That guy sounds familiar. Please don't kill me. <laughs> and then they, they tie her up and lock her in the van and then steal her Beamer, which leads makes me wonder, why did they lock her in the van? And what happened to that lovely couple who were looking to buy the house so that they can look at stars? <laughs> I was wondering about that, too. The people, like, where were they just in the house? They don't even know what happened to the realtor, like, waiting for her to come back. <laughs> She's never coming back. <laughs> Over at a bar, Sonny's having a therapy session with a bartender. He remembers his dad sucked the pool because he taught him how to suck at pool, too. <laughs> you see how clumsy Sonny is on the pool table. <laughs> Which, remember, in, like, season two, he's like a pool shark. But he's, like, clumsily handling well, the cue ball on that table. He mentions that his dad was a snooker champ. So, and I mean, that's not really pool. <laughs> Snookers for suckers. <laughs> the bartender's yep. name is Kathleen Giffords. Is it Kathy Giffords? Is that what, that what we're <laughs> that, going they with? They were going here? with that's that, what, but they couldn't yeah, use it. Going with. Okay. All right. We're, we're going to go with hey, good looking. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny's on vacation. He likes to drill everything. It's not nailed down. So Kathleen's directly in his crosshairs. Oh my God, man. And she's totally falling for it. She's setting it up. He is gonna not, he's knocking this thing out of the park. You know, she's like, what are you waiting for? Wait for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you know, she's like, well, if you wait till 6 a.m., I'll show you my country music collection. Starts <laughs> talking about making them breakfast. This is going good, man. Like, all the way to the point where he's walking outside. Obviously, 6 a.m., he stayed drank the whole night away. <laughs> uh, but he's totally going to hit that, man. <laughs> they go for a walk, and at the same time, Scotty, Cruz, and Wilson come pulling up to a store. Cruz and Wilson go inside couple police officers see Scotty, who's just air strumming out a great classic rock song on that boombox that's inside the car. That's the key to the boombox. They, they're like, Is he able to keep his preset they, they're like, while they steal multiple cars? The cops are looking over and like, look at this moron. <laughs> the cops go over and pull him out of the car and start patting him down. And that's when Kathleen goes into the store to go get something. A few seconds later, Wilson and Cruz come out with her hostage. They shoot the two police officers, get in the car, and drive away. Sonny has to dive through a plate glass window into another store to hide from the gunfire. When he comes out, he sees one cop's dead, another cop is dying. He says, well, an ambulance will be here shortly. He steals someone else's Trans Am and takes off after Cruz and Wilson. He was about to get lucky, so I get why he chased after her. Because, I mean, like he put all that work in all night. Like, not going to let this thing in. And, and what are the chances a beautiful 1978 Trans Am just comes flying up? Like, <laughs> So Sonny gives chase, and they have Kathleen, and they're riding out through, like, this dirt road, because they say Doc Jerry lives out, quote, end quote, the sticks. So they don't have an address. They're just kind of cruising around <laughs> Looking in rural for it. Florida. Sonny comes flying up, but Cruz is going to take care of this real easy. He's going to lean out and shoot out the tire. Hits on the first try. Sonny loses control, crashes into a tree. He's now stuck out in the middle of the glades. Who knows why they didn't stop and just finish him off. They just drove away. That was enough. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, he hit his head in the crash. And you know I what know. head trauma means. Exactly. That means amnesia, which means evil Burnett should show up, right? Right? Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking, too. Which was, oh, man, is this going to trigger a murderous rampage? He's like the Hulk. He's like getting all angry. He's like, oh. Oh, and he like jumps up, <laughs> eyes green, just starts running through the forest after the car. No, that's too crazy and far fetched. Okay, you don't get amnesia <laughs> twice in the show, only the once. <laughs> Unless you're on Days of Our Lives, then maybe you can get it twice. <laughs> We take a quick interlude to Tubbs with no beard, and then back to stealing cars. <laughs> the only question I have about the vice team investigating what happened at the store is like. Where does jurisdiction end for Miami Vice? Well, because he's involved, they had to be there too. You know, they're just getting they're just getting the info. How would they even notify it at that point? The only person who knows Sonny is a cop is the person who was kidnapped. How are they even notified that Sonny Crockett of their department? Because, I mean, yeah, Sonny tells the cop that's been shot that he's a cop, but he doesn't tell him who he is, you know. I, this is badge my badge thing. number. Yeah, exactly, no. So, like, how does the vice crew even know that, like, he's involved in that? The only important thing we find out in the scene is that Tubbs should have never shaved that beard. <laughs> The vice team does find out that there's a million dollars to stake here because they never rolled on their accomplice after a, a bank heist. And so that's what they're out to do. They're out to figure out where this money is. Meanwhile, Sonny has hijacked a man's Jeep and tell him to run and get help. 
after flashing his badge and then just drives away in the man's Jeep. And the guy's like, how am I going to go anywhere? I'm in the <laughs> middle of nowhere. <laughs> and this is when he says the guy whose Jeep he stole says that the Beamer was heading for Pine Key, which is a few hours away. But I wonder how long it take for him to walk back to get help from the police. How long was he driving past them? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it's a few hours, how do you know if someone's heading somewhere that's a few hours away? <laughs> that's like me driving past you, <laughs> uh, you know, on First Street and saying, like, they're going to Arkansas. <laughs> Out on Pine Key, the prisoners break into Doc Jerry's house, guns blazing. Are they partners with this guy or are they hunting him? I don't understand. I don't know what's going on with this. And is he really a doctor? <laughs> Have my Starting to have questions. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's got a medical license. <laughs> Doc's not there, so they're going to wait for him to show back up. Cruz then looks at Kathleen and says, hey, so uh, now I'm going to do some bad things to you. <laughs> now what's going to get gross? Scotty tries to stop him, but Cruz turns around and breaks his nose. And he cries like a baby. Why did you break my nose? Like, Yeah, you want to go back to Miriam, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Miriam never popped you in your nose. <laughs> Lewis has no remorse for him. No, I don't. totally bitch left, crying like a baby. <laughs> Sonny's driving down the freeway. He sees the white beamer abandoned, so he gets out and hikes in, and just in time to see that Kathleen is about to be assaulted. No, no, he takes his sweet time. Just kind of sneaks over, <laughs> looking through the window. You know, she's totally fine. I'm not, I mean, she's not yelling like she's being sexually assaulted or anything. He takes so long that Doc Jerry has the opportunity to sneak up behind him. And then Cruz and Wilson sneak up behind Doc Jerry. <laughs> it's a bunch of sneaking. <laughs> and now they're going to go inside. Sonny is that now before they hit him in the head again. That's the second <laughs> head trauma. They we need know. to get evil. Evil Burnett should be here by now. <laughs> they don't know who they're dealing with, though. They shouldn't be hitting him in the head. <laughs> Sonny is now tied up and they're working him over. Cruz is beating him, Vietnam style. Sonny is refusing to talk. Then they go to Doc and ask him where the money is. He says, it's not there, but I can take you to where it is. Liar. Scotty's going to stay with Sonny. He's going to keep him at gunpoint, even though he's oh, tied up. You, you, you missed one important detail. Sonny's one night stand blurts out, he's a cop which does not help at all right now. <laughs> Scotty's just excited because he's going to get a moment to listen to his rock and roll music. Finally. <laughs> Leave it on Weedle D over here. <laughs> Tubbs is down the street talking to the man that got his Jeep jacked. And he says that Sonny was heading that out towards Pine Key. And so Tubbs runs off. But the man also says that Pine Key is only about 20 miles from here. But I thought you said earlier it was a few uh, hours. Like, make up your mind, dude. <laughs> doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That was a brand new Jeep. He just got the winch attachment. He got new rims. Got some walkers on there. Like, that was a sweet <laughs> Jeep, and he just took it. <laughs> I mean, what kind of off-roading do you have to do to get to Key Pine? I mean, is it, like, you know, how windy is this road? Can they just put a bridge in and get you out there faster? <laughs> At the house, Sonny is trying to convince Scotty, man, you should just cut me down. They're never coming back for you. They're just going to keep the money. You got bad friends. You should make good friends. You should leave your bad friends behind. And that they will get caught eventually. And if Scotty is willing to help Sonny, he'll make sure the judge goes easy on him. Oh, oh yeah. He can show. If he just pretends like he has amnesia, don't <laughs> let him get away with whatever <laughs> happened. He, you could trust him, too, because he's doing it right now and it's working. <laughs> Scotty starts to cry. I'm, I miss Miriam. Told you. And he goes and he cuts Sonny down. And Sonny, the first thing he does is punch him square in the face <laughs> as hard as he can. Why did he do that? Why couldn't he like, tie him up or something? Like, why did he have to punch him out? Like, <laughs> right in the kisser. Yeah. His nose is really broken now, by the way. You know, it, you would think that his partners would have been smart enough to teach him about stranger danger. But no, <laughs> Scotty. Down the road, Cruz, Wilson, and Kathleen and Doc are all having a nice hike through Gator Country. I mean, Florida can be kind of nice. Yeah, they're just randomly searching for Doc's buried treasure, you know, like he's some kind of pirate. So <laughs> they find, a, a parrot, like he's counting his steps or he's counting how many rocks they pass or whatever. And he finds his hidden gun. As we find out, spent all the money on hair plugs and now he's broke. <laughs> Did they really think he would have that he would save the money for them? You would also save a million dollars like out buried underneath Why? the rock. I don't understand that, that theory on, the, on that. They would they wouldn't save the money for him. They're 
both crooked. So why would he save the money? Like, why would he do that? He says that he invested <laughs> yeah. the money and then there was a stock market crash and then all the money was gone. Yeah, I don't think he knows what he's doing investing money, so... <laughs> Doc tries to fire his gun, but it's empty. Just it's it's waterlogged. <laughs> <laughs> it's been buried in that uh, hole all these years. <laughs> turns out, yeah, if you leave a gun outside for a long period of time, it might not fire when you need it to. So now Cruz and Wilson have nothing. They shoot and kill Doc, who was supposed to have their money, but all their money is gone. They go on this murderous rampage across the Miami-Dade County and into whatever county the Glades are in. And so now the police have like a bee on them. They have a cop tied up at their house. They got nothing. Once again, this crime stuff is hard. Off in the distance, they hear music and they think Scotty must have cut Sonny down and like followed them. Maybe no he was like listening to his music as they walk. So Dumpy, I mean, Wilson <laughs> is going to climb up the hillside and go see what's going on up there. We Humpty Dumpty. That's what he looks like. <laughs> and when kabloom! He gets, <laughs> when he gets up there, kablamo, Sonny hits him with the stereo right in the face. Stereo finally comes in handy. <laughs> they tussle for a while. Sonny gets a 4x4, four four, hits Wilson a bunch of times, gets him underwater, and starts choking him out and drowning him. And you see the look in Sonny's eye. You see it. Burnett, still there. That crazy man, that murderous rampage. He's there. No, he's not, because he didn't kill him. Spoiler. Where, where the hell did he find that two by four? <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert, because I think he totally, I think he totally intended on killing him. I think he's just rusty at it because he's been having to pretend to be crooked His again. His hands aren't t- strong enough. To squeeze him. Now Sonny goes running down. He sees that Cruz is now going to try and finish off what he's been trying to start with Kathleen. He gets there just in time. They tussle. And wrestle for a while. Sonny beats the crap out of him until Cruz finally Dude, gives up. Like that first, that first punch he throws. I, I think he punches her too. <laughs> like they both go flying off of him. I thought he hit her too. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. He pretty much beats him to death, and that should be the end of the episode. Except he has problems finishing things. And Wilson's not actually dead. He comes up, he's going to shoot Sonny, but just in time, Tubbs shows up and shoots and kills Wilson. And that's the end of this criminal escapade out in the glades. But not the end of the episode, because it is still very important that Crockett close this deal, because he's put a hell of a lot of work in for this (laughs) one night stand. I mean, he did. He went the he went the extra mile for this lady, stopping her from being raped. <laughs> <laughs> Sunny says, "I still got some vacation time left, and I'd love to stay out here and be banging with you during my vacation." I'm rich, by the way, totally rich. <laughs> got all this pop star money. And then they freeze frame on this conversation, and the episode's over. The last conversation, she says that she only expects. Three things out of a guy for him to treat treat me right, for him to be a good dancer, and then she whispers something in his ear, and Crockett goes, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> my, my question to you guys is, what do you think that third thing is? He has to have so, a big winner. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, what I, I, that's what I that. was assuming. <laughs> I have so, an average size, well, he, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He is also pretty kind of conceited, so it could have been involved in sort of Kungalinkin as well. <laughs> this episode. It's terrible. No. <laughs> <laughs> this episode was a total shock. <laughs> in all the wrong ways. Before we go really deep on our final thoughts on this episode, too, because I think we have many, <laughs> about, especially about Cruz and Wilson. Yeah. And the actors that they chose to play these people. But before we get there, let's go talk about this week's music, because there is a legendary person in music. Well, more than one, I should say. Let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John, there's a couple big name bands in this. One of them we've heard from before, but one I'm surprised worked its way into this episode. What do you got for us this week? Let's just get the obvious out of the way. We have Power and Freedom and Cold Metal by Iggy Pop. You may also remember him from appearing in my music for the episodes Kill Shot and the episode Blood and Roses. So this is his third appearance. 
So being his third appearance, we're not going to spend too much time. I'm just going to give you Iggy Pop. His band was the Stooges. His best friend forever was David Bowie. Uh, they even went to rehab together. You know, he's that old punk guy. Not the one with the bleached hair and the earring, but the one that looks like a retired skateboarder or some <laughs> old surfer. That old surfer guy that tried to sell you pot once on the beach. Like that guy. That you pop. So, let's move on to the original music of the ep- episode with Don't Talk Dirty to Me by Jermaine Stewart. He was the one performing at the prison. That really was Jermaine Stewart. Best known for the 1986 hit, We Don't Have to Take Our Clothes Off. He sure doesn't want to do a whole lot of stuff, I'll tell you that. (laughs) We don't have to do any of that. (laughs) We Don't Have to Take Our Clothes Off reached number two in the UK and Canada and number five in the US. But his career started well before that, where he began his career as a dancer on Soul Train in the (laughs) mid-1970s. Him and three of his friends, uh, other dancers on Soul Train, would eventually move to L.A. and audition for pop group Shalimar, which was being put together by Soul Train creator Don Cornelius, a few uh, uh, business associates. He'd lose out on the lead vocalist spot, and so he would end up touring as a dancer with the group for several years. But while in London for a show, he would meet Culture Club's Mikey Craig, and Mikey Craig would help him put together a demo and even get him a job singing backup vocals on culture club song miss me blind would attract enough attention to get him a record contract his first album saw some success but his second album 1986's frantic romantic was really the breakout album and that was the one that featured we don't have to take our clothes off and don't talk Dirty to Me. It peaked at number 34 in the U.S. Third album was also successful, and then his fourth and final would do well in the U.K., but make little impact in the U.S. So by 1991, he had teamed up with producer Jesse Saunders for what would be his last recorded work, uh, or last known recorded work. It would be released as a single and would sell poorly, and the actual album is still remains to this day unreleased. Uh, whoops. Uh huh. Shortly before his death, he began recording an album called Believe Me, and some of the tracks were released in 2005 on a compilation album. But before he could finish recording the album, Stewart died of AIDS related liver cancer on March 17, 1997. Wow. He was 39 years old. Wow. That brings us to Hank Williams. The tragedy would be in this story as well. We have the song I'm So Lonely I Could Cry. Hank Williams is the, an iconic country singer and songwriter and is well regarded as one of the most significant influences of 20th century music. He recorded 35 top 10 singles, five of which became top 10 posthumously, including 11 nuns. His actual name? Hiram. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but for a while it was spelled, it was misspelled as a uh, Hir- Hirium. So, and as a kid, he was called, often called by the nickname Herky, Harm, or Poops. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah. sighs> so his dad was a World War One vet. I'm not going to go into too much detail because I can go into a ton of detail about his childhood, but... He moved around a bunch. He had, he had kind of a rough childhood. He, w- he was diagnosed with spina bifida. His dad had health problems and was in the hospital for years at a time. His mom worked like five jobs during the Depression. But what spun out of all that was while he was living in Georgiana, he would meet Rufus T. Tot Payne, a street performer, and Payne would give Williams guitar lessons in exchange for meals prepared by Williams' mom, Lily, and he basically taught him to blues. So in 1937, the Williams and McNeil family opened up a boarding house on South Perry Street in downtown Montgomery, Alabama. This is when Hiram would change his name to Hank. He would also win a talent show for a all fifteen dollars. <laughs> wow, you could get a good sized wagon for that. Much. <laughs> and he would spend his days performing on the street in front of WSFA radio station. And the radio station would actually occasionally invite him to perform on air to the point where they started getting so many listeners asking for the singing kid that the station gave him his own 15 minute show twice a week for a salary of guess what guys 15 whole dollars a week <laughs> 
He would funnel that into the start of a music career. He would start a band called the Drifting Cowboys. His mom, Lily, at the time, would be their manager. He would drop out of school. And he would begin touring. In between tours, he would do his radio show. But this is also when alcohol issues started to show up, as he would commonly spend the show's revenue on booze at the show. He didn't even leave. <laughs> no, he really wasn't making a lot of money, you know, the touring part. But he still had his radio show. World War II would break out, and he would re- receive a deferment. So, and this is where I have some issue with his bi- with the Wikipedia page because it says he receives his deferment for a back injury falling from a bowl during a rodeo. Okay. Or maybe it could be because he had spina bifida. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah, there was a, no. a, whole, a whole lot of rodeo stuff happening in that biography. But suddenly he can't go to war now because of the rodeo. Yeah, yeah. But we did make spina bifida back in his childhood that would cause him excruciating back pain to life. But no, no, it was the bull he, when he fell off that bull that one time. <laughs> his entire band would be drafted into service and he would be all alone and his alcoholism would worsen and the replacement band members would start to refuse to play with him. And by 1942... He would be fired from his radio job for habitual drunkenness. Wow. He'd spend the rest of the war working for a shipbuilding company and performing at bars and probably spending that revenue at those bars. Hey, Melissa, you sure Hank Williams Sr. isn't your grandfather? I think he might be. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds an awful lot of his track record. So, <laughs> so in 1943, he would meet Audrey Shepard. They would illegally marry at a Texaco station with hopes of starting a new band and getting his radio show back. How do you get illegally married? So there's a lot. station. <laughs> I'm confused. Why was it there's illegal a, though? Because is she young or something? Is that what it was? <laughs> no, there, there's a little bit to unpack here. So it was illegal because she was still technically in the 60 day grace period after her divorce. And this would also be a common theme in William's life. Technically, their marriage would never be legal, even though they got married by a justice of a peace at a perfectly good Texaco station. <laughs> Basically, he helped him get his, get his crap kind of together, and he would eventually get his radio pipe, and she actually would get him a small record deal by interrupting producer Fred Rose's weekly ping pong game. <laughs> She's a brave woman. Now that's going to bat for your man. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. right, you get hurt if... interrupting someone's ping pong game. I'm sorry. I don't know if I would interrupt someone's ping pong game for your career. I don't know. <laughs> Post-war so... America was so extra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the recordings from that would, would garner attention from MGM Records. He would receive a record deal in 1947 and release Move It On Over, which would be a massive hit be thrust into his own national radio show plus tours and finally find a place in the Grand Old Opry, which he years before he auditioned for and was turned down. So he would start touring with the Grand Old Opry. His first show, he would do six encores, which is a record. Then by 1951, he was touring with Bob Hope and he had numerous hits. He did his first TV appearance on the Perry Como show. By the end of 51, things would start to fall apart again. Would be injured in a fall on a hunting trip with his fiddler Jerry Rivers. <laughs> I mean, never trust, never trust a fiddler. I don't know what he was thinking going hunting with his fiddler. <laughs> Once again, this would stir up his back issues, and he would begin abusing prescription drugs this time on top of alcohol. He would eventually go into treatment in December of '51, as well as move back with his mom during his treatment that would kind of be the end of his him and his fake wife shepherd <laughs> he would again record a ton but would eventually be fired again but this time by the grand old opry for guess what guys habitual drunkenness <laughs> surprise he'd move back to louisiana he would play shows and do local radio but and during this time of him being fired by the grand old opry one of the songs he wrote was about billy jean jones billy g jones was a girlfriend of his of one of his band members at the time who eventually became his girlfriend and then his kind of sort of wife because their marriage wouldn't count either because she was still technically married before and the divorce had <laughs> it, it's this whole thing i don't think they actually understand how marriage works and how it how a divorce works 
Shit so they would never. This is all sounding very, very Tennessee up in here. <laughs> By 1952, he started to suffer heart problems due to his excess. This is when he would meet Horace Toby Marshall, who was an ex-convict and a basically a fake doctor. He was a <laughs> con man who convinced him that he was a doctor. He would prescribe amphetamines, morphine, and other painkillers. And for some reason, he had to help Sorry. him move bull semen around. <laughs> And, well, that would kind of lead us toward the end of William's life. He would be scheduled to perform at Municipal Auditorium in Charleston, West Virginia. But because of an ice storm, he would hire college student Charles Carr to drive him from Knoxville to the, the uh, event in West Virginia. Carr picked him up at a hotel room, and when he found him, he would request a doctor. He would give him an impaired poop, a shot of vitamin B12, and with a little bit of morphine in it, you know, because uh, <laughs> that, that, that should help. They would drive for a while, he would stop briefly at an all-night restaurant, Poot would turn down any food, which would believe to be his last word. They would drive a little bit longer, and they would stop at a gas station, only for Carr to find him dead, and that rigor mortis had set in. Mm. Between that diner uh -huh. and the gas station. It sounds like Carr was like, yeah, I thank God he finally fell asleep, <laughs> I just couldn't handle this drunken ass in my back seat this whole time. Uh-huh. Oh, it's just so happy he's been yeah. asleep for so, a few hours. Dr. Ivan Malinum would perform the autopsy. He would find hemorrhages in Poot's heart and neck, which would ultimately be ruled heart failure, but as kind of a suspicious death because he would also note that Poot appeared to be severely beaten and recently kicked in the groin area. Very mm. hard. Wow. He would also record that he had a visible welt on his head in order an inqu inquiry, though there's no information about how that inquiry went. Wow. So, Poop died at 29 years old, and I actually Googled it. I Googled Hank Williams' murder, and there are a bunch of different theories out there, but I will tell you this, that there is a more extensive breakdown of his last days but really knows for sure but apparently this trip with him and car was more of a road trip and i guess they stopped at radio stations along the way and he was partying and they had girls in the hotel room so god knows what actually happened on this road trip before he just magically wound up dead at this gas station it could be something as simple as he did do rodeo and what one of the stops was was a rodeo stop or it could be as complex as one night things got too rowdy and he got beaten re re really bad and you combine that with his bad heart and he bled he internally bled to death and when Carr realized that there was going to be this paper trail of all these crazy nights that they had together it's going to look like Carr murdered him he like tried to stage it up so it looked like I was just escorting him across the country and he died in the back seat. Yeah, like had he not know he was dead and Rigor Mortis had set in. <laughs> yeah. And I guess Dr. Ivan Malinum was thick Russian who barely spoke any English. So <laughs> there's all kinds of weird stuff about this. Died very early, 29 years old. Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. All right, Melissa, look at this from the perspective of a longtime Vice fan, not like me and John going through this for the first time. What are your thoughts on this episode? It's a very disappointing episode. <laughs> I mean, I know that we we have wackiness on Vice, but this wasn't wacky. This was just bad. This was just poor, poor planning, poor writing, poor directing, <laughs> a lot of poor acting. <laughs> I was I was not interested in the story at all. I mean, even I think what it was too, because of the the, the storyline of the criminals being so bad, I didn't even really care what Sonny was doing. Like, this just feels so forced. I gotta throw this in here. Well, I got this stupid these two stupid criminals going around doing ridiculous things, but then let's throw in a heartfelt Sonny who's like who's like spilling his life story to this psychiatrist and also to this girl he meets at the bar <laughs> he's never talked about his dad to anybody else ever in the show all of a sudden he meets some girl at the bar and he's like my dad you should play snooker <laughs> yeah yeah I, i've never told this to my wife or any yeah. of my major exactly. girlfriends but exactly uh, hey hoochie bar at the backwoods <laughs> uh, at this backwoods bar you want to hear about my abusive dad it just doesn't make it it makes it so that you don't care about the sunny story because you just want to get through the whole entire episode also it doesn't if 
I don't feel like, and you guys haven't even seen it yet, but I don't feel like it fits with season five. I feel like this is one of the episodes they were like, we got to throw, we got to have something in there where it's fun. We had such serious episodes. And you can tell, I know we talked about it here, that that storyline, that episode was like in the wrong order. And you can tell by the sequence of what happened in the episode before to that. That doesn't feel like it's in the right order. It should be somewhere else. It's it's too too campy, too goofy, too silly to be like right after he's up, he's coming back and he's realizing you know like that he could not have a job and he may be actually be a killer. <laughs> <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? This is just such a waste of an episode. We shouldn't even be here. We should be at the Sunny Burnett trial or the Sunny Crockett trial. I don't even know why Vice felt this was. Why do we have to go silly here? You know, do the trial, get him guilty or not guilty, get us through the finishing, the the aftermath of the Sunny Bur- uh, Amnesia arc before you decide to go silly as in, you know, floating Jamaicans and aliens and <laughs> battling preachers, you know. Don't do that now. It just doesn't feel like it's right. And, and you know, Melissa's right. It's definitely run out of order because uh, I, I looked at the notes and spoiler alert, we get to see Tubbs shave his beard off next week. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Clearly it wasn't supposed to be there to begin with. And so it's like, why, why did they feel it necessary to jam it in like that? you got to have a break from the serious episodes, but not yet. We're still coming back from Evil Burnett and the aftermath of all that, wondering if Sonny's ever going to be a cop again. We get like five minutes at the open of cops calling Sonny a douchebag. And then we spend the whole rest of the episode out on the farm with a storyline that ultimately just doesn't matter. At, at the end of everything, uh, we're back in the same spot we were. We don't know if Sonny's going to be a cop. We don't know what's going to happen with the Vice team. And none of this really matters, except that maybe he bones a bartender. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with you guys. This is a bad episode, bad writing, bad directing, bad acting from all of our guest stars. This is really awkward. And every scene where we have Cruz Wilson and Scotty, it is bad. They are the bad link here. They're the ones that stink this place up <laughs> bad. As I mentioned earlier, I think this episode was required because they needed to get out the sunny stuff of him questioning, like, was that me? Was that a part of me? Will that always be a part of me? Where does this take me? I'm starting to question why I'm a police officer, which was in the first episode of the Hackman one, where he starts to say, I never want to be that kind of cop. Well, now he's realizing I am that kind of cop. I am taking things personal. I am lashing out at people. There was a whole section of my life where I was a criminal, a bloodthirsty criminal that murdered people on sight. So who am I really? And the thing that's triggering all of this is me being a police officer. That if I wasn't a police officer, I wouldn't have these thoughts. But because I'm a police officer, I have to surround myself with, quote, unquote, sleezoids. And that's where I'm scared of myself because that's where I feel comfortable. That's 10 minutes of talking. There's 37 more minutes they need to fill into an episode. So then we get this other story that comes in there, which is just bad. But I totally understand where this episode comes from. I also get NBC's perspective, and I'm just going to put some conspiracy out there. They had originally said they wanted season five to be a shortened season so they could end it on the right note for fans. Writers and the producers of Miami Vice say, Please let us do a whole season. We already have episodes written. NBC relents and says, okay, fine. You can have 22 episodes. I'm assuming somewhere around bad timing, NBC says, all right, listen, end this at 17 episodes. <laughs> we'll put the other ones on USA later. <laughs> yeah, we're done. <laughs> so I don't have anything to add. This is a bad episode, and I'm glad we're past it. But I also understand the context of a lot of this stuff and that's going to do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode of go with the heat we would love to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com let us know where you stand on this episode bad timing because i mentioned we understand the context but we also said it's pretty bad let us know what your thoughts are on this and let us know what your thoughts are on how this ties in the whole amnesia arc because this is technically the last episode so how do you feel about this being the last one for the amnesia arc email us go with the heat at gmail.com be sure to check out that website go with the heat.com you can find all the ways to subscribe all the ways to support us support step number one email us go with the heat at gmail.com contact us 
Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. You can find all those places where you can contact us. We would love to hear from you. Support step number two, check out that Patreon. As I've mentioned in the past, we support the value for value model. If you find value in this show, we'd love for you to show how much value you find in this show. Go support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. And let us know how much value you find in this for as little as a dollar a month. You get access to all kinds of new Patreon exclusives. Plus, you can show how much value we bring into your life. We bring you an hour plus every week of value. We'd love to see how much value you put on that. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. Bye.